Now that is how we get your attention and your toes tapping. Danelle Damon and Greater Works, that is the perfect start to this 49th annual community celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King. They have got your blood pumping, and yes, the blood still works. I'm Monique Minglovin from Cairo 7, and I am so grateful to be back with you here this year at Mount Zion Baptist Church. We cannot fill it with people again, not just yet, but we can fill it with music, we can fill it with fellowship, and we can also fill it with a challenge to make this about more than just one day, but it's gonna be a great day. We hope you and your families are happy and healthy. We know there are many who have lost loved ones these last few years. All of us have dealt with and tried to adapt to some pretty profound changes. We hope you feel the support and the love for you and your families here today. We thought it was best though to produce a video so that you can view it safely at home. But we needed to be here. I need to be here. And our hope is that we can make you feel like you are here with us as well. We want you to feel the love, the togetherness, and also the essence of our great community. Now, during the show, you may see some production folks in and out of frame here. That's how we do it. You'd see them if you were here as well, and we're pulling back the curtain a little bit and letting you see how this production works. We're just gonna roll with it here today, you will too. And also, hopefully you'll note that we are following all COVID protocols to keep everyone safe. This is amazing ground and space that we're sharing both physically and virtually with you right now. So it is my pleasure at this point to introduce Dr. Valerie Hunt, who will acknowledge the land that we stand on today. On behalf of Seattle Colleges, we acknowledge we occupy the traditional ancestral lands, sky, air, and water from which we benefit as the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancestral heritage. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the native communities that continue to demonstrate resistance in the face of efforts to separate them from their lands, their culture, and each other. We honor the survival, the adaptations, the forced assimilation, the resilience, and creativity of Native peoples, past, present, and future. We encourage participants to consider their responsibilities and to stand in solidarity with Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people and their sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, city, state, and institutions are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to this continent from the African continent and recognized the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of this country and continue to serve within our labor force and we acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Finally, we acknowledge that our institution relies on hourly, student, contingent, and unpaid labor and we recognize those contributions. To the people who contributed this immeasurable work and their descendants, we acknowledge our and their indelible mark on the space in which we gather today. It is our collective responsibility to critically interrogate these histories, to repair them, and to honor, protect, and sustain these lands. Thank you. And now, I'd like to introduce the Reverend Dr. Patricia L. Hunter. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the officers, members, and friends of Mount Zion Baptist Church, we welcome you here today. We are grateful that we can again partner with Seattle Colleges for this important Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. program. And how we wish that we could celebrate with all of you in this space. But once again, the Omicron virus is reigning in ways that we wish justice would. While we can't be together in this place, we can celebrate and remember Dr. King in our separate places. Let us remember how we spoke truth to power and believe that love wins over hate. In our separate places, let us commit to speak up and stand up so that justice will roll down like water and righteousness as an ever flowing stream. Again, you are welcome at Mount Zion. Thank you, Reverend Doctor. It is indeed wonderful to be with you here today. Again, I'm Monique Minglavin, and I have to start with a confession. I have to be honest. I love my job as an evening anchor for Cairo 7, but it has been a wait for a couple of years now. As with all of you, the ongoing changes and the challenges and the loss of this pandemic, they have taken its toll. And division and disinformation, they've spread even more rapidly. It's exhausting to push back against this tide. And so coming together like this today, this becomes even more important. It is more essential and it's more of a salvation. So I wanna thank you for allowing me to be a part of this community and a part of the call to keep Dr. King's vision and fight, not just a part of history, but a part of today, a part of the future, a guide for the future. And I thank you for allowing me to be in the company of such wonderful guests as we have today. It is a smaller group, but it is mighty. On stage, we have Seattle College's Chancellor, Sean Pan, of course, Reverend Dr. Patricia L. Hunter, and also North Seattle College President, Shamin Crawford. And a special welcome and thanks to Seattle College's Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, and students. Thank you all so very much for all of the work that you put in to sponsor and program this great event. Thank you, thank you all. Now, if you're like me, you cannot get enough of this choir. We all need this kind of music, this kind of energy in our lives. And we get another dose right now. The world's greatest choir, <laughs> Greater Works with the Black National Anthem, Lift every voice and sing. Wherever you are, if you could take a moment and honor the Black National Anthem with us, thank you so very much.
Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I also would like to thank everyone involved in making this program possible. The love and energy we feel when we are together carries me for weeks to come. I know that you share the same feeling today. When I look around and see the choir, the Reverend, Monique, and all the people with mics and cameras running around, it affirms to me how important Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his legacy was and is today. Despite the challenging times we face, we have taken precautions to ensure everyone knows we will celebrate this day and its meaning for the 49th time. It is clear this isn't our first nor the last time. We will keep Dr. King's vision, teaching, wisdom alive, so they will serve to guide our work towards a racism-free and equitable community. In my mind, social justice, higher education, and building a beloved community all work hand in hand. Michael Eric Dyson reminded us of this a few years ago in this very room when talking about how Dr. King's education prepared him for greatness at a young age. To paraphrase, and I quote, you can't do homework when the crisis hits. You got to already know the words. If you want to be king, do the work, get up early, study the lessons, and go to school. I couldn't agree more. Higher education provides more than the opportunity and prosperity. It gives our youth the tools to make change, articulate rebelling against racism, inequity, and oppression, if you will. Our Seattle College's Promise program is an outstanding example of social justice, education, and a community coming together. The program targets the underserved. It uses wraparound services along the entire educational journey 
of our students. And it is embedded in the rich educational culture fueled by the community it serves. With vision, commitment, and hard work, and the dedication of Seattle College's faculty and staff, we are providing young people with opportunity to learn and grow. The regional and national recognition we have received is a testament to our power, sustainability, and persistence. On one level, it is about the students. <clears throat> We're committed to their success completion. Even during the pandemic, we held true and were a stabilizing force for so many. On a second level, it is about community support. Our partnerships with the city of Seattle and Seattle Public Schools have enabled us surpass our goals and make us a national model. But we're not done. There's still much work to do. For whatever reason, young men of color are not going to college. And those that go are not completing, graduating at the same rate. And the long-term cost, whether in reduced earning potential or greater vulnerability to job loss, cannot be accepted or tolerated by anyone. We know how to combat this, though. Evidence shows that mentoring supports makes a life-challenging difference for all students, but particularly for students of color. With that in mind, we at the Seattle Colleges have launched Project Baldwin, a name that honors James Baldwin, the celebrated American author. Project Baldwin is a mentoring program joined on the insights and successful efforts across the country and close to home. Our fellows Fridays at Seattle Central College and South's Men of Color program at the South Seattle College are serving as the building blocks for what we hope becomes a high-impact, cost-effective mentoring program that by demonstrating clear and precise results can progressively grow and serves a substantial share of our student population. As a starting point, our focus will be the Black, Latinx, Latin American, Asian Pacific Islander males who at our colleges typically complete programs at rates 12 to 14 points below their white and Asian peers. For more about the program, here's a short video. My mentor is DeAndre and that man is patient. Having someone else to talk to that you know you can rely on in a tough situation, like a constant variable to keep you anchored, is something that is just, it's amazing. How we started the Project Baldwin program really was a vision to uplift our men of color. Mentoring is more than just a word, it's actions. The support that a student, a man of color is going to need is going to be beyond books. Action now can dismantle the inequities that we see within our college systems that have placed barriers in front of our men of color. DeAndre really propelled me forward like as an adult because one of the things that I always struggled with in high school when it was time for me to start thinking about college is I didn't know what kind of person I would be in the future. I was always scared of uh, of becoming an adult because I didn't exactly know what an adult was. I think I expect a lot out of Rico. He expects a lot out of me. I do. Um, and that's important. You always making yourself a, a resource that, that's always ready and willing to help is just, it's everything. 
that's the joys and the value of our our bond and our relationship from mentee to mentor is that we learn from each other and that we grow with each other. It's an honor to be able to be called his mentor. I see so much in him. I know that he will be great. But Rico's story is one of many stories for our men of color within the Seattle colleges. We pride ourselves on creating anti-racist campuses. And so really, I think it's about, you know, building relationships on campus where everybody feels that they can be their true, authentic self. Project Baldwin's are really gonna help us uh, keep things integrated and connected, really serving as that umbrella um, to all of our programs on all of our campuses. We try to move mountains to make sure um, that we're at least removing barriers for these students one day at a time, one student at a time. I know for me, when I was graduating, I would not have been able to get through without the help that I had. The Seattle Colleges would not be the Seattle Colleges without our men of color. This initiative will impact generations after generations, and that is what it's about for us within the Seattle Colleges. There's multiple generations that will come up behind Rico, and to see his success, somebody will say, because of Rico, I am. And that's important. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. In closing, let us focus building our community, keeping our eyes on the prize. And this video shows there is work to do, and we are the people to do this work. Dr. Pan, thank you so much. And thanks for letting us look at that video um, and seeing some of the amazing work in action. It's so great to see Rico and DeAndre. I mean, Rico seems like a mentor at this point instead of a mentee that uh, speaks to just the work of DeAndre and that entire uh, program. Uh, the only thing that lets you know that Rico is still young is a big youthful smile and those fantastic braces. So it's good to see some of the people involved in that program. If you are looking to get involved, this is really it right here. Right here in this community, we are setting the trend in educating and developing young people. We are here, of course, to celebrate the accomplishments of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We would also like to acknowledge the leadership and the vision of another very special individual from our community. Of course, that is the late Reverend Dr. Samuel B. McKinney. Reverend McKinney was a giant, a giant among leaders in the Northwest. He helped to launch Seattle's first black-owned bank after local banks restricted loans to African Americans. He served as an original member of the Seattle Human Rights Commission, which successfully advocated for passage of Seattle's first Fair Housing Act. In the 1960s, he took part in civil rights demonstrations in Seattle, Alabama, and Washington, D.C. And he talked his college classmate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., into coming to Seattle back in 1961, and that was Dr. King's only visit to the city. That is just a small bit of his legacy. He changed the people here, he changed this community, he changed lives, and he helped shape what we are now experiencing and what will come in the future. Now, Seattle College has created a scholarship in Reverend McKinney's name. It is a small yet significant way. We use higher education to pay homage to Dr. McKinney's deep faith and also his commitment to social justice and equality. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Shameen Crawford and this year's scholarship recipient. Thank you, Monique. Kiros Bailey arrived in America in 2016, having fled the country of Eritrea, located in the Horn of Africa region of Eastern Africa. The only boy in a family of seven, he knew his future under Eritrea's dictatorship would severely limit his ambitions and dreams. He first met his future wife in Israel, and the road to Seattle was paved through the process of integrating his new family, and Kiros first attended Seattle Central and studied to become a medical assistant.
And just as his healthcare career was getting started, he realized his true goal was to become a nurse. North Seattle was the closest college to his home and he decided to go back to school and major in nursing. After finishing his nursing prerequisites this spring at North, Kiros will transfer to a four-year university and complete his BSN. Fluent in four languages, Hebrew, Tigrinya, Amarek in English, he has worked hard to fulfill his goals. While being a full-time student this past year, he has also held down a job delivering food for Instacart. The father of three boys, Kiros knows being a role model is important as his family grows. Please join me in congratulating Kiros, the 2022 McKinney Scholar. We truly hope that you're enjoying being with us on today. The next song we're getting ready to minister to you simply talks about over and over, he keeps on blessing us. Yeah. Life happens over and over, but miracles happen over and over. Yes. Happiness happens over and over. Yes. It's all about perspective. I hope you enjoy this song.
How about that? Inspiration and music and in a story, Kiros. I don't know how you do it. You are earning your cape and your angel's wings and uh, wow, just an inspiration. It's wonderful to hear that story and to see that kind of work at work in our community. We've got even more for you here today, folks. Dr. T. Elon Dancy, he is our keynote speaker, the executive director of the Center for Urban Education at the University of Pittsburgh's School of Education. He's also the Helen S. Faison Endowed Chair and holds faculty appointments in Africana Studies and Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Before going to Pitt, he served in various community engagement and academic inclusion roles at the University of Oklahoma. As an education sociologist, Dr. Dancy studies educational settings as sites of power, hegemony, and identity negotiation. And more specifically, his scholarship draws upon theories of intersectionality, black feminism, and anti-blackness. This is to engage us in questions related to the political economy of education, masculinity formations among boys and men, and students' academic and social outcomes an author and co-author of an extensive list of prominent books and publications. He is actually here today to discuss the relationship between higher education and men of color. Now, Dr. Dancy's professional service includes serving as past chair of American Educational Research Association's research focus on black education and past chair and executive board member for the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in American Higher Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. T. Elon Dancy, who joins us via Zoom. Thank you for the introduction. What an honor it is to be here among you for the 49th community celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. My thanks to the Seattle College's event organizers, particularly Ernest Phillips, Barb Child, and DeAndre Fisher. I also want to thank and acknowledge DeAndre, not only for the invitation, but for his energy and his dedication to university equity and justice. I'm overwhelmed, overjoyed to keynote such an important event and during such an important moment in our national story. I also congratulate Seattle Colleges for its creative thinking in establishing the Baldwin Project, named for radical thinker and writer James Baldwin, who Toni Morrison remembered at his death as having crowned us. That is, as having crowned Black people through helping us to know ourselves when we read his words. Guided by the examples of these towering figures, the Baldwin Project can make a powerful intervention for freedom and change in the lives of Black men and men of color, as well as Seattle colleges. As I crafted my comments today, I located three opportunities. The first is a brief reflection on the King legacy, which I will offer to you is at the center of a long power struggle. The second opportunity is highlighting where both King and James Baldwin's educational philosophies meet to offer a vision of freedom. And I'll close with guiding thoughts for the emerging Baldwin project. I begin by asking us right now in our hearts and minds to rejoice as we honor a man philosopher Cornell West has called the most significant and successful organic intellectual in American history. Never before in our past, West argues, has a figure outside of elected public office linked the life of the mind to social change with such moral persuasiveness and political effectiveness. We need King's example, his teachings and writings to minister to us in these dangerous times. Everywhere, all around us are examples of what work is needed and why. Every day in the headlines are tales of harm and atrocity of widespread sickness and corruption. I can't breathe is not only the familiar haunting phrase from black fathers murdered by the state Eric Garner and George Floyd, but countless black people and people of color disproportionately suffering from COVID-19 and with disproportionately less access to healthcare options. And there is no time like this annual event to remember just how this phrase is not just about state police murder or viruses, but because black people and people of color are denied a right to survive and thrive virtually across every American institution, housing, healthcare, employment, policing, 
incarceration, and government. Within educational settings, Black people and people of color disproportionately bear the brunt of expensive college tuitions and loan debt. Meanwhile, public schools, which remain a part of the assault on Black youth and communities, now face a mass teaching crisis. And in both settings, we endure the continued demonization of critical race theory, a white supremacist attack on teaching the truth of history as experienced by people who have lived on its underside, a terror campaign that once again seeks to remove Toni Morrison's novels from our children, to remove the reality of slavery from how we learn about the United States and this world, and to remove any suggestion that whiteness is anything other than the default way to be a human being. Being Black in America and around the world unfairly marks us to suffer the anxiety of knowing that there is no guarantee of personal safety. This is often a moment Black parents describe with their children called the talk. In the words of author Kiese Lehman, America understands Black people as best as born on parole. And the election of the first Black president did not change this. However, despite what society does to us, the creativity, resilience, and world making that Black people demonstrate daily teaches a lesson about what is humanly possible. The realities of Black life guide us in how we might begin to organize to fulfill King's vision for a life free from our current prisons. This is a serious moment. The generations are turning over. We are losing so much and so many of our wise ancestors who have taught and inspired us. Toni Morrison, for instance, and several most recently, Bell Hooks, Sidney Poitier, Lonnie Guineer, Greg Tate, Maladoma Patrice Somme. We speak their names. This is a challenging time and an intimidating one too, because it demands a response from us as a people, as students, as communities, as citizens, as thinkers, and as life forms, if we are to carry forth King's justice work. We should be very concerned with how the state, the same state that declared him an enemy, now distorts his legacy, sanitizes his arguments, deodorizes his critiques, and renders him and his teachings, even in death, its property. Weaponizing our own King, our own Dr. King against Black people and against freedom struggle. This same state invokes Dr. King's name in fraudulent and ahistorical ways to preserve white supremacy and ideas like gun ownership rights, racial discrimination, and the most conservative of political party values. Dr. King was used to scandalize Colin Kaepernick when he knelt during a national anthem, to shame Ferguson protesters demanding justice for Mike Brown, and to try to suppress protests against police killings across this country. It is disgraceful that during this month, King breakfasts, lunches, and dinners from coast to coast will feature some of the most conservative of state appointed representatives who actively and openly support the capitalism, targeted incarceration, death penalties, imperialism, and militarism King preached against all his life. These acts intentionally diminish King's teachings to multiracial handholding rather than honor his hard work and struggle toward a world without militarism, racism, materialism, and poverty. He is even being used to suppress teaching that promotes critical thinking about this country and its laws. For instance, a few months ago, I organized a campus-wide panel on the attack against critical race theory and the impact of this attack on education and society. After this event was publicized, I received an email from a fellow professor who informed me that teaching critical race theory was against Dr. King. Specifically, he wrote that it was a form of indoctrination that undermined Dr. King's teachings and beliefs and then wildly ended the email with a Dr. King quote about thinking intensively and critically as the purpose of education. While the quote is correct, it is absolutely 
misapplied in this context. The email and the professor's audacity in sending it to me is indicative of the kind of distortion of the King legacy used against Black people and freedom struggle. Now, if the professor was thinking intensive, intensively and critically, they might understand that critical race theory is not only aligned to King's teachings, but King is himself a critical race theorist. Critical race theory is not a departure from King's philosophies, but the embodiment of them. Perhaps in the simplest terms, critical race theory argues that if we want to understand US law, we must understand it through the lens of racism. I argue that King, imprisoned nearly 30 times by the state for all kinds of trumped up charges, is one of our best teachers and examples of what critical race theory is, means, and why we need it. I didn't respond to that email, but if I did, I would ask, who do you think King is? And this question is not just for him, but for anyone. They ignore or seem to have forgotten that Martin Luther King Jr. was unpopular among the country's majorities and was assassinated as an enemy of the state while organizing a poor people's campaign in an America he described as sick. They only remember a phrase from the I Have a Dream speech, but they seem not to take seriously his letter from a Birmingham jail in which he wrote that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere in which he wrote that Black people experience grossly unjust treatment in the courts, and in which he wrote of his disappointment with not just white conservatives, but the white moderate who he referred to as the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom. The white moderate, he defined, is more devoted to order than to justice, prefers a negative peace to the presence of justice, and paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. He goes on to define the white moderate as failing to understand the power dynamics embedded in phrases used today like law and order, and how this becomes the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. They have forgotten the king that lets suffering speak always, that let victims be visible, and ensured that social misery would be put on the agenda of those in power using his prophetic gifts to analyze the tragic circumstances under which people and Black people in particular struggle. They have forgotten the king that wrote the words, I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to give my life for the hungry. I choose to give my life for those who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. This is the way I'm going. If it means suffering a little bit, I'm going that way. If it means dying for them, I'm going that way. Because I heard a voice saying, do something for others. They forget that at the time of his death, King was writing the sermon and the warning why America may go to hell. They forget his worry and his lament that he feared he may have led his people into a burning house after witnessing how the state uses policies we think of as progressive as opportunities to reformulate and retrench power dynamics. This is also, by the way, a point that critical race theory makes. And as much as American politicians shamelessly urge protesters to be more like King as a way to shut down freedom struggle, they ignore that if King were alive today, these same politicians would denounce him as a terrorist, as a predator, and a troublemaker, like they did when he lived. King and his legacy, you see, are still territories of power struggle, and those of us faithful to his teachings must seize opportunities to deeply study his philosophies, to organize, to speak truth to state power, and most importantly, to watch over him in death as he watched over us in life. And on this day, how serendipitous it is for Seattle colleges to also honor James Baldwin, who was a contemporary of Dr. King and was actually one of the last people to introduce Dr. King in his lifetime. 
The date was March 16, 1968, during a fundraiser at Anaheim's Disneyland Hotel. While the two did not always agree about every aspect of freedom movement, they both struggled with America's commitment to the belief that white people matter more and the lies the country continues telling in big and small ways to make that belief palatable. They also have many similarities in how they talked about the purpose and method of education. That the function of education is for deep and critical thinking. That its function is for the development of morality, of character, of justice. In his now classic, A Talk to Teachers, Baldwin would go on to write that the paradox of education is that precisely at the point when you begin to develop a conscience, you must find yourself at war with your society. It is your responsibility to change society if you think of yourself as an educated person. This I offer as a principle, purpose, and praxis for the Baldwin Project. In the poem Caged Bird, Maya Angelou wrote, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. Freedom, and that is why we are here. That is why I am here. And that is how the Baldwin Project might think about its exciting possibilities. To learn with men of color that the focus of any education should be for us to win freedom. And I am not talking about the hundred years of enslavement, chattel enslavement in this country, but our current enslavements in new and recomposed forms and how these shape the world we experience today. Educating ourselves for freedom means awareness of the very serious world in which we live. Students are entering college during a time of national unreasonableness, contradiction, and paradox. America dares to see itself as the exception, the most civilized nation and a democracy, a nation where all men are created equal, unless of course you are a woman, unless you are black, unless you are not white, unless you're a person of color or gay or transgender, unless you believe in Allah, unless you are disabled and unless you are poor. In my book, The Brother Code, I argue that the models of manhood for Black American men are in large part predicated on white colonial models as the generational horrors of the transatlantic slave trade cut us off from indigenous and pre-colonial ways of being. A significant intervention the Baldwin Project can make is working to free men of color from the obligation that being a man is only possible in white patriarchal formations. This involves deep unlearning about who we are, who women and girls of color are, who queer people are, and how we might organize ourselves within loving collectives to fight for the freedom of us all. It is true, if some of us are not free, none of us is free. And it's our knowledge traditions that teach this very truth. The Baldwin Project can be a place where Black men, for instance, do the liberating work of redefining ourselves for Black people and the world we want to see. This is a powerful extension of both the Dr. King and James Baldwin legacies. Again, critically taking up sexism and homophobia as a part of this redefinition project is essential, as I can think of nothing sadder than for queer transgender Black men to feel and be unsafe in an organization named for a gay Black man. Life has not been as fair or as just as I would like it to be. Still, I press onward and upward toward the light, and so must you. In each of us burns the fire of ambition, the fire of brilliance, the fire of bravery, and the fire of our ancestors who are from an African land of indigenous people and whose gifts to this world are unimpeachable. We may come as one, writes Maya Angelou, but we stand as 10,000. Carrying the mantle of King's legacy is by no means easy work, but it is what we must do. It is who we must be and become. It is what we have always done and who we have always been as a people. 
Martin Luther King did the work even when people abandoned him. Malcolm X did the work even when people abandoned him. Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells and Ella Baker and Septima Clark did the work. Harriet Tubman risked her life in the woods, sometimes alone and fearing that she would lose consciousness at any moment because of a childhood head injury inflicted by white plantation masters. Never stop your pursuit of education for freedom. For the moment we do, we fulfill the dreams of our enslaver. And when times get hard, as they do and will, let us remember the words of Gwendolyn Brooks and her poetic epitaph to Martin Luther King Jr. as I close. A man went forth with gifts. He was a prose poem. He was a tragic grace. He was a warm music. He tried to heal the vivid volcanoes. His ashes are reading the world. His dream still wishes to anoint the barricades of faith and of control. His word still burns the center of the sun, above the thousands and the hundred thousands. The word was justice. It was spoken. So it shall be spoken. So it shall be done. Hmm. So it shall be spoken. So it shall be done. Thank you so much for this invitation. I wish good love, healthy choices, and second chances today and always for each of you. Thank you. The next song we're getting ready to sing simply says, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, no matter what kind of praise, is to our God. Thank you so much.
Well, that should get you ready for the rest of today and beyond. We've given you a lot to think about and act on as well as dance to. What a program. How about a hand for Danell and Greater Works? They never disappoint. They are fantastic. And also, we want to thank Dr. Dancy. Inspirational words, to say the very least. Words to think about and, again, to act on. Now, as we close another celebration, it is our sincere hope that we were able to give you comfort and also the feeling of the past celebrations. We cannot wait to see you in person again. We certainly hope that will be the case next year. Uh, now, Danelle and his choir will close us out once more with We Shall Overcome. Thank you for being a part of the journey on today. We would like to thank Seattle Colleges. We would love to thank Monique Ming Lavin for hosting us on today. I would like to say thank you to Mount Zion and the Greater Works Choir. As we exit today, it's always been a tradition to sing this song as a finale led for many years by the late Reverend Dr. Samuel McKinney. We shall overcome. Thank you. <laughs>